So of our classical ciphers, Caesar cipher is easy. Okay, that's the easy one we saw, uh, or the easiest so far. Um, we saw a brute force is simple. Brute force, try all keys. 26 keys, try them all. You'll get the one of those potential plaintexts will make sense, and you'll have the the key in the plaintext. Then we last week we introduced a monoalphabetic cipher where we simply de define the key as the mapping from one letter to one of the other possible letters. And I didn't write it in full, but an example, we choose a mapping from letter A to any of the possible 26 letters, and from letter B to any of the other 25 letters, and C to any of the other 24 letters, and that mapping, however we choose it, is the key, in fact. So when we encrypt, we just do a mapping from plain text to the corresponding ciphertext. If I choose a different mapping, it's a different key. And with this simple scheme of mapping one of the possible input plain text letters to one of the uh, one other letter in the character set, if we have our twenty six lowercase English letters, we get 26 factorial possible keys, or 26 factorial possible mappings. Because A can map to 26 possible values, B to 26 minus 1, because we just use 1 for A, and C to 26 minus 2, or 24, because we've already used 2 of the 26 for A and B. So we get if you keep doing that, 26 times 25 times 24, 26 factorial possible keys. If we did, had a different character set, maybe we included uppercase and lowercase characters, treat them different, then we have 52 factorial, factorial possible mappings. Depends on the size of the character set. Brute force attack, not, boss, not possible, but I pointed to a, a web page that shows that it's very easy to do an attack on a monoalphabetic cipher based upon the statistics of the input plaintext. We exploit the regularities of the language. Every language has some structure. Some letters are more frequent than others, some uh, words are more frequent than others. By using that structure we can uh, defeat a monoalphabetic cipher. That's cryptanalysis. And we pointed that this is just an example. If we take some English text, count all the letters in that English text, then it turns out, for this example, English text, in this case, there are 12% E's, 9% T's, and almost zero Z's, and so on. So we can use those statistics to do an analysis. I will not go through an attack for this in the class, but you should read the website which is pointed to from our course homepage that, that documents an attack on a monoalphabetic cipher, and you can see, see it in progress. It's quite easy to do. We'll return to this after we look at some other ciphers. Oh, well, actually, we can say something quickly about it now and then return. So if we think of English, 26 letters, we said in typical English text, plain text, some letters occur, occur more frequently than others. E is more frequent than Z. Okay? What this plot shows is that in order of the most frequent, so the most frequent letter through to the least frequent letter, normalized between 0 and 1, so the most frequent letter is 1, the least frequent letter is 0, and the others in between are, are normalized based upon the, the values, or the frequency compared to uh, the most frequent and the least frequent. If we look at the solid line which is marked plain text, that comes from some typical plain text or a set of plain text. So what you could do is maybe collect a hundred books, long books in English, count all the letters, count all the A's, B's, C's and so on. 
work out the percentage of each letter, and that tells you the frequency. What this shows is that for the most frequent letters, right, there's the most frequent, and then the second most frequent, and the third most frequent, and so on, and then the least frequent letters in typical plain text. So there's some letters which occur much more often than the rest. There's some structure in the plain text. What we want with a cipher is to take that plain text which has structure, encrypt it, and get cipher text that doesn't have that structure, that doesn't exhibit this structure. And the perfect case is if you take the plain text, encrypt, and you get cipher text which we say is random. Random and we'll talk about random in, a, in detail in one topic, but we can say random would be of all those 26 letters, they occur about equally in frequency. The letter A occurs as often as the letter Z. And of course also not in sequence, so it's not all A's and then all B's and so on. So random would be this horizontal line. Because the f one letter would have the same frequency as the all other letters. That's what the horizontal line shows. And with 26 letters, what do we get? Uh, 1 divided by 26 in this case. What do we get? Uh, what? Well, I'll check the numbers later. Uh, all letters, the same frequency. That's what we desire for a perfect cipher. Because that means that the cipher text doesn't exhibit the characteristics of the original plain text. There's no structure. And if there is structure in the cipher text that can be mapped back to the plain text, then the attacker can take advantage of that. So what we want is no structure in the cipher text so that the attacker cannot take advantage and work back to get the plain text. So this is an example of typical plain text showing that some letters are more frequent than others. The horizontal line is our ideal cipher, the output cipher text. All letters occur with the same frequency. We're going to go through some different ciphers and compare them. And we'll return to that after we go through these other ciphers. So we've got two or three other ciphers, uh, classical ciphers. There are many more, but we're just covering several to, to illustrate some different concepts. So far we looked at Caesar, and we're looking at substitution ciphers. We take one letter and replace it with some other letter from the character set. So with Caesar, the character set is A through to Z. We take our letter in plain text and replace it with some other letter to get the cipher text. How do we replace it? Well, we follow this Caesar cipher algorithm of doing this shift to the right, or in math, add the key value mod 26. We replace one letter with one other letter in Caesar cipher. Similar in monoalphabetic cipher, to encrypt the word bad, B-A-D, we take B and replace it with Z, a with D and D with L in this example key. We don't have to replace one letter with one other letter. We can look at groups of letters at a time. And the Playfair cipher does that. Let's go through and see how it works and then we'll look at some characteristics of it. What we do is we, we assuming the 26 English letters, as the character set, we write a 5x5 five five matrix. So we have a 5x5 five five matrix, 25 elements, 26 letters, 25 elements. We're going to treat the letters I and J as the same. We'll see how it works in a moment, but let's say I and J are the same letter. So it gives us 25 letters to start with. What we do is we have a keyword. That's going to be our key. We have a keyword. You choose your secret keyword. You write that keyword in the matrix row by row. 
So you fill out the first row, then if there's letters remaining in the keyword, the second row, and so on. And then the remaining elements in the matrix, you finish with the rest of the alphabet in order. So that none of the letters are repeated inside that 5 by 5 matrix. We'll do that, and then we'll encrypt. And the example, we're going to encrypt plain text with the keyword Thailand. Generate or, or draw the matrix. So there are our rules. Let's try and do that. Uh, what do we start? So we write our keyword in a five by five matrix, which is five rows, five columns. So there's our five columns in the first row and we move on to the second row. And we don't repeat letters because what we want to do is fill in this matrix with the entire alphabet. Now I say the entire alphabet, 26 characters, but let's treat I and J the same. So in fact this I, I'll note here, also is a J. Come back to that. So Thailand is our keyword. We already have the letter A, so let's, the next letter is N. So we write our keyword, and now for the remaining elements of the matrix, fill out the rest of the alphabet in order. So we have the letter A already, so the next one is B. We have D. I usually make a mistake with this. Let's see how we go. F, G. We have H, I, J. We have T already. There's our 5 by 5 matrix for our Playfair cipher. So we have a, a secret. That's the keyword. So the, the entity that's going to encrypt and the one that's going to decrypt must know the keyword for this to work. No one else knows it. So we write the keyword down and then fill out the rest of the matrix. Now we take our plain text and encrypt using this matrix. And the rules to encrypt, we operate on a pair at a time, a pair of letters in the plain text. So a diagram is a pair of letters. So we break our plain text into pairs of letters and we look up the matrix using those pairs of letters we find those that pair in the matrix and we do a replacement so what we do is the plain text so we have a pair two letters in the matrix we find them in the matrix the ciphertext output will be the value on the same row as the first letter and the same column as the second letter. We'll see some special cases, so we'll come back to the special cases in a moment. What's our, sorry, what's our plain text? Hello. We're going to operate on pairs of letters. write hello just so we can remember. We're going to operate on pairs of letters. So we have five letters in this case, we're going to need six. So we need to do, do, deal with some special cases sometimes. Uh, the first, so the first pair is going to be HE. The second pair is LL, but there's a special case first. We cannot have a pair with the same letter, otherwise the algorithm won't work. So when we have a pair that then the two letters are the same, we insert a special character, a special letter. And the, the simplest one is to say X, but 
any letter that we can def we can define to be the special letter, but we'll use X because X is not very common in between two two letters. Okay, so we define instead of having LL, let's split LL into LXL. Okay, to separate the two, where X is our special character, so it'll become LX. So really, I've inserted an X in here. And so H E L X and then L O. Convenient brings us to six characters or three pairs or three diagrams. Diagrams. So we have some special cases for this algorithm to work. One of them is if you have a pair, we break the plain text into pairs. If we have a pair that has the same letter, then split it up by inserting some special letter. And both the encryptor and decryptor must know what that special letter is. They must agree upon that. So usually it's the part of the algorithm. So let's say it's X. If we had a letter remaining, we'd add that special letter at the end to, to pad it out to be an even number of letters. In this case, we've, we're up to six characters, so we're fine. But if we had a seventh character, then we'd have to add an X to the end, so we've got another pair. Now what we do is consider a pair at a time, HE is the first pair, to encrypt we look up in the matrix the letters H and E and the output ciphertext is the letter on the same row as the first, so we'll get two letters out. Consider letter H, the output ciphertext is the letter on the same row as it, on this first row and in the same column as its partner, E, in this case. So the same row as H, the same column as E, the output will be L. Okay. And then, because we're dealing with a pair of letters, we have H, E, then we consider E. The same row as E, the same column as H, the output will be D. So the output pair will be LD in this case. That will encrypt, uh, and I'll write it in uppercase, although our characters are always lowercase, just to distinguish that's the ciphertext, LD. Do it for the last or the next two pairs, LX and LO. So encrypt LX, the next pair, and then encrypt LO, the, the third pair. Hmm? How come I got D? Uh, because, remember, we operate on a pair at a time. The, the input pair was HE. Okay, that was our plain text. So the output pair the output ciphertext, what we do is cons for H, the first letter in the pair, look at the row of H, the first row, and look at the column of its partner. The column of its partner is this fifth column. Its partner letter is E in the pair. So the output is L. It's on the same row as H and the same column as E. That's the first output letter, L. But then for the second output letter, we had HE, so we look at E, same row as E, same column as its partner, the partner of E is H, we get D. The next pair, so H, E, L, X. LX becomes LX becomes a yep okay good yep okay let's try and draw 
let's look at this. So our input in the first instance is, well, what do we have? Hey, G. We deal with a pair at a time. So here's H, here's E. Consider the first letter in the pair, H. Look at the collar of the row, the same row as H, and look at the column of its partner letter. The partner letter of H is E, so the row is the top row, and the column is the last column. So we end up with the element in the same row as H and the same column as E. And then we do it again, but from E's perspective. The same row as E, this row, the same column as H, we get D. And that's the ciphertext. Then we have, and a few of you have done it, H, E, L, X, L and X, same row as L, same column as X, we get A, and then the partner letter, the same row as X, the same column as L, we get Z. And what's the last one? Uh, what do we have? L-O. What's the answer? L-O. This one doesn't work. We need a special case. Because L and O are in the same column. So if they're in the same column, shift down to get the ciphertext. That's the rule. So L and O in the same column. So it doesn't make sense to look at the, the pairs in a normal way. So what we do is L becomes E and O becomes U. So if they're on the same column, we take this, we have a special rule that shift down. Did I get that right? Shift down or shift up? I got it right. Good. If they're on the same column, then the output ciphertext, so L and O, is the ones below it. And when we need to, we wrap around. So if the input was, for example, EZ, then the output would be O and wrap around to L. Okay, so we wrap around where necessary. If they're on the same row, so if the input was MO, the output would be M becomes O, O becomes F. Okay. On the same row, move to the right, wrap around if necessary. On the same column, move down, wrap around if necessary. So the ciphertext becomes L, D, A, Z, E, U. Just repeat that here. Just a different cipher. Okay, so we get our six characters of ciphertext. And that's on the pre on the slide in our lecture notes. Uh, decrypt essentially do everything backwards. So someone receives the ciphertext L D A Z E U. They generate the same matrix. So the person who receives the ciphertext knows the keyword Thailand. They write the keyword. They fill out. The decryptor gets the same matrix. And then they do a lookup, LD, okay, LD. What's the input plaintext if LD is the, the ciphertext? First, same rule here, H, 
H E. Okay, same row, same column. But for L O, so they receive ciphertext E U, they receive E U on the same column, therefore to decrypt, they move up, not down. And they'll get L O back as the output. And when someone decrypts, if they follow those rules, when they decrypt, what will they get as the plain text? If you decrypt the ciphertext L, D, A, Z, E, U, you'll get, and you can check, So the person receives the ciphertext, decrypts, and they get H-E-L-X-L-O. Does it make sense? Well, not quite. And then the, the decryptor needs to recognize that, okay, this X is probably a special character. And in most cases, you'll be able to recognize that because in very few words, does X become come between two letters like that? So... It needs a little bit of post-processing to recognize that this X was inserted as a special character just to make the algorithm work. So they'd remove the X and they'd get hello. It works much better when you have longer plain text because you can see those words. Any questions on how it works? We go through these ciphers reasonably quickly. We'll give an example of each. Uh, you should be able to work them out, decrypt and encrypt uh, after a simple example. Any questions? Playfair? So you know Caesar. When you do the quiz this week, you'll do Caesar, uh, monoalphabetic, Playfair, easy so far. Now the point about Playfair cipher, we're operating on a pair of letters at a time. With with our Caesar and monoalphabetic ciphers, we encrypt one letter at a time. And it turned out that that one input plaintext letter always mapped to the same ciphertext letter. It's not necessarily the case with Playfair. If you have, in our case, I'll go back to our slides, our input was H-E-L-L-O. The two L's in there if we use Caesar or monoalphabetic, those L's would map to the same ciphertext letter. But with Playfair, they don't. Right? That is, just because there are two L's here doesn't mean there are necessarily two characters of the same, uh, two same characters in the ciphertext, and they're not in this case. So what Playfair does by operating on a pairs, pair of letters at a, at a time is it spreads out these statistics of the frequency of letters occurring in the ciphertext. Even though there are two L's in the plaintext, there are not two characters of the same uh, in the ciphertext. Yep. What is an odd number of characters? An odd number of characters in our input, we pad out the end with a special character. So we add an X at the end, for example. So if we have uh, Steve, S-T-E-V-E, -E, five characters, none of the diagrams are the same character, we'd have to add an X to the end as the plain text because the Playfair cipher works on a pair of letters at a time. Okay. So it's padding, it's called padding. Turns out we need that in many algorithms, including practical algorithms, because they usually operate on fixed size blocks if we have something of a different size, we need to pad out uh, to make the algorithm work. Playfair, by operating on pairs of letters, makes the statistics about the frequency of letters in the ciphertext to be more spread out than in the plaintext, making it harder to analyze. But it's still relatively easy if you have uh, computer support. I don't have an example of, of breaking it, but uh, you can do it um, with a bit of effort. Because still, diagrams still 
have some frequency in the ciphertext. Uh, so every pair of letters in the input plain text, in many cases, will map to the same pair of letters in the output ciphertext. So by using analysis of the language structure, you can break the cipher. So that's just a different example from what we've seen. So yes, it's breakable quite easy with language analysis or the frequency of digrams, trigrams, and expected words. Most of the examples I go through are short, either words or short phrases, just for simplicity on the board. Uh, in real communications, usually we have longer plain text. You know, sentences, usually large, large files or large documents to communicate, a large stream of values. And in those cases, the statistics are much more accurate in terms of frequency of letters, diagrams, and trigrams. So, we've seen three. Caesar, monoalphabetic, Playfair. Another general type of cipher is polyalphabetic. Use different, different uh, substitutions for the character set. Don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one mapping of encrypt one letter and always get the same ciphertext letter like in Caesar and monoalphabetic. And there's some examples of ciphers, Visionaire, Vernum, and One Time Pat. And we'll, the textbook has this one. I've never covered it as an example. We'll look at Visionaire and One Time Pat. And we'll see their advantages and the problems. Visionaire is easy. It's an extension of the Caesar cipher. It's really the set of 26 general Caesar ciphers. What we do is we have some plain text. With a Caesar cipher, with that plain text, we chose a single letter key. And that letter mapped to a number with the Caesar cipher, and that number determines how many characters we shift by. That was the Caesar cipher. With the Vision Air cipher, what we do is we have a key word. In this example, Cyrandor. And what we do then is we repeat that keyword as many times as necessary such that the key, which is made up of the keyword, is as long as the plain text. So this simple example, here's my plain text, Internet Technologies, my keyword, Cyrandon, I, I need to repeat it so that I have the same number of letters. That's the rule for this cipher. If uh, I had some more characters here, I just keep repeating S, I, R, until I get the same number of characters as the input plain text. Repeat the keyword. And then I encrypt using the Caesar cipher, where here's the input plain text to the Caesar cipher, I, and the key is S, or 18. And encrypt I with key S, you get A as an output. And just to remind you of the Caesar cipher or the mappings. Uh, let's bring you the, the letters. Just remember the mapping from Letters to numbers. Input plain text is I. The key is S. So we look them up. We start with I, 8. Key is S, or 18. 8 plus 18 is 26. 26 mod 26 is 0. So the output ciphertext is 0 or the letter A. So it's just applying the Caesar cipher. Then the next letter in plain text is N, but we have a different key. We don't reuse the key across each letter. 
we now have the key I, N and I. N is 13, I is 8, 13 plus 8 is 21, the output is V. And we get our ciphertext value V. And we do that for the rest of the letters. So we're just using the normal Caesar cipher, but instead of using the same key letter for every input plaintext letter, we use a different key letter, where the key letter comes from the key word repeated as long as necessary. Any questions on how to encrypt and decrypt with Vision Air cipher? Let's look at some advantages of this compared to Caesar and a monoalphabetic. When we have letters which are the same on the input plaintext, we don't necessarily get the same letters in the output ciphertext. That's the advantage. So here we have N and N in the input. We get V and Q as the output. Or if you look at the E's in the input, we have, which is normally the most frequent letter, we have E, 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 four E's. The outputs for those E's are M, L, R, and V. So if we have a long plain text, and we'd expect for a long plain text, about 12% of the letters would be E. That comes from our typical analysis. In most cases, E is the most common. Let's say 12% of the letters on the input are E. Using the Vision Air cipher, what we'd expect is that the output ciphertext letters would be all different when we encrypt that E, which means we wouldn't necessarily have 12% of one particular letter in the output ciphertext. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping of, of plain text to ciphertext letters. One plain text can become one of many possible ciphertext letters. That's because we change our key letter in this case. So that's the key advantage, or the important advantage of uh, the Vision Air cipher. But if we have an input plain text, because we repeat the keyword, there still may be a chance of repetitions in the output ciphertext. Do we get one in this case? Uh, we see in this case we have a T encrypted with an R to get a K, and another T encrypted with an R to get K. So in this case, Input letters T become the same output ciphertext letter, although this T is different. If we extend the plain text and keep going and make it long, which is typical, then there's more chance that same letters in the plain text will map to same letters in the ciphertext. And that opens up a chance for the attacker to take the ciphertext, look at the frequency of letters in the ciphertext, and try and map that back to what the plain text is. So it makes it uh, vulnerable to an attack. What we want in the ciphertext, remember, is an even distribution of the letters with no relationship to the, or no visible relationship to the input plain text. Visionaire cipher almost does this, except the fact that we repeat the keyword. Therefore, there may be repetition or structure in the ciphertext. What do we do to improve? Suggestions? Comments? Questions? You have a question because you asked him. He can tell you the answer and then he can tell me the answer and I'll explain to everyone. Problems? It's okay. It's all right. If you have a question, let's solve it because you have a quiz this week. This one. Okay.
we just use uh, the Caesar cipher on each instance. Let's go backwards. The, la the last letter, S, okay, look at S, is the plain text. The key is N. Where did N come from? Well, what we did is we took our key word, our secret, and just repeat it. S is the plain text, N is the key, we use the Caesar cipher. Remember, take S as the plain text and shift it by N or 13 positions. So you go to the right 13 positions and you end up at, is it F, I think, in that case. Yeah. Because if you look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen positions to the right of S is F, because we wrapped around. So when we encrypt S with N, we get F as the ciphertext. The Caesar cipher. So you need to know how Caesar cipher works to, to understand this. The problem with the Vision Air cipher is that we have a keyword which is usually short relative to the input plaintext. Now consider a long plaintext, we'd have to repeat Sirenthorn many times. Why do we have a short keyword? Why? Why have a short keyword? Easy to remember. Okay, Remember the keyword is some secret that we need to communicate between the two entities and they need to be able to remember it or use it. Okay, Imagine we don't have computer support. This is 50, 60 years ago or earlier. We want to encrypt on pen and paper. I need to remember the keyword is Sirenthorn. Uh, so we usually we use a word or a phrase, something we can remember easily, and it's usually short. If my plain text was a megabyte, a megabyte text file, I usually have a short keyword as the, as the secret. And that leads to the problem with this cipher because with a long plain text and a short keyword, we repeat the keyword many times and we still get many chances of repetition in the ciphertext. When we have repetition in the plain text, we get some repetition in the ciphertext. We get some structure, not, not random ciphertext, which is a problem. So how do we fix it? Easy. How? Randomize the keyword and even better, so instead of Sirenhorn, I choose A, Z, Q, X, F, G. All right, I can't remember it, but it's random. That's going to help because there's no structure in the keyword. What else? Hmm? Change the frequency. Well, we can't change the frequency of the input plain text. Uh, assuming we want to work with any input plain text, we don't control that. We could use a longer keyword, a long random keyword. And the ideal case is as long as the input plaintext. So with my plaintext of whatever it is, 20 characters, instead of choosing Sirenthorn, what would be better is to choose a 20 character random keyword. Because then we'd do the same, apply our Caesar cipher, when we have all our E's, if the keyword is random, then it will map to a one of the uh, to a random letter, and the output ciphertext would be random. Double encrypting, encrypting again. Yes, it helps. It helps. We'll see an example of that later. Yep, so encrypting again, we'll see, is a principle that's used in many practical ciphers, or encrypting multiple times. This one, though, of course, encrypting again 
halves the performance. It takes more time to, to encrypt. For this one, a simple extension, choose a keyword which is random and as, as long as the input plaintext. So is this Vision Air cipher breakable? Yes. Uh, it's harder than the others, but it's still possible. The weakness is the repeating structured keyword. The solution, choose a non-repeating unstructured keyword that is a, a long random keyword. And that's where we get what's called the one-time pad. The same as the Vision Air cipher, but use a long random key. And it's perfect in terms of security. It's unbreakable. Uh, do we have an example? Let's see if we can find an example. Maybe one I've done before. I think I've given you a printout that uh, is in your lecture notes. I'll see if I can find that. Rather than having to do one on the board, on the screen. You should have this printout. Uh, somewhere behind the, uh, towards the end of your lecture notes. If it's not there, then it's just a printout of one of the web pages linked to from our course website. It looks at the one time pad, gives an example. Uh, we'll see another one in the, the lecture notes. Uh, but just bring up the example. I'll go straight to it. So the one time pad we can think as the Vision Air cipher, but with a long random keyword. Um, and it doesn't show very good, but it's here, and it's run off the screen. Uh, we zoom in a little bit. Here, I use some software to encrypt some plain text. The internet is a global system of interconnected, da -da -da, and it kept going. I use the Vision Air cipher, but I chose the keyword to be random, there's no structure, I generated a random keyword and it turns out the keyword was as long as many characters as the input plaintext. Sorry, there's something missing there. Not a very good example because it runs off the screen. The, what you see here is the output ciphertext, sorry. You don't see the keyword because uh, doesn't. the keyword was this. That was the random keyword and this was the resulting output ciphertext. The input plain text had frequencies as shown here. So the plain text message had 10% T's, 10% or 10.5% E's. So E and T the most frequent in this selected plain text. And then O was the next frequent and then N and then we go down. So that was the plain text. We see some are much more frequent than others, which is what we expect in any plain text. When we encrypt and then look at the frequency of letters in the cipher text, we see most of them are about the same. Okay, these are a little bit more frequent, but just 5%. With 26 characters, we'd expect, what, about 4% for each character. About one in, uh, 1 in 26. So with 100 characters, and we have 26 different letters, we'd expect about 4 of each. 4 out of 100. So about 4% would be uh, even for all the characters. Well, these, some are 5, many are 4, some are close to 4. There are a few others down the bottom. This is, was an example where we use the one-time pad and the resulting ciphertext 
Some letters are a little bit more frequent than others, but not much. Okay. The ciphertext, it's as if all the output letters are random and therefore occur about the same frequency. That example is probably not so good to show on the screen. Have a read through in your lecture notes to see that. Let's go back to this plot. This plot shows for a selected plain text and then encrypted using some of our different classical ciphers. The plain text Frequent letters shown here. The least frequent, the 26th here. We want to encrypt such that we get an even distribution of the letters in the ciphertext so that there's no structure in the ciphertext. And some analysis in this example shows that, okay, with Caesar cipher and a monoalphabetic cipher, we get the same frequency of letters as the plaintext. That doesn't help in that case. Playfair spreads them out a little bit, okay, so that there are some letters much more frequent than others still. Visionaire is better in that the frequency of letters is much more lower compared to the rest. So the most frequent letter is a little bit more than average, whereas with plain text it's much more. And the ideal case is that every letter occurs equal number of times the horizontal line, and in fact that's what one time pad achieves. The one time pad achieves this ideal case with long enough inputs it will produce the same number of A's, the same number as the number of Z's in the output ciphertext, and Q's, and R's, and B's, and T's, and so on. Approximately the same number in the ciphertext. And random random arrangement of those characters. Therefore the ciphertext has no structure and therefore the attacker cannot do any, any analysis to determine the original plaintext. Cryptanalysis is impossible with a one-time pattern. So the one-time pad is perfect in terms of Cryptanalysis. There's no way for the attacker to give in the ciphertext if they don't have the key to work out the original plaintext. What about brute force attack? One time pad, how do we brute force it? Try all the keys. How many keys are there if my plaintext is 10 characters long? No. 10 to the power of 26. Other way around. How many keys if it's if my plain text is 10 characters long? Well, if my plain text is 10 characters long, my key will be 10 characters long. And the way I choose my key is randomly choose like the first character will be one of 26. The second character will be one of 26, and the third character one of 26, and so on. So uh, let's go back to our example. How many characters do we have in our plain text here? Is it 21 characters, or about? Plain text 21 characters here. What can the key be? If I use a one-time pad, not Sirenthorn, a one-time pad, the first letter of the key can be A through to Z. 26 possible values. The second letter of the key can be A through to Z. And the third, A through to Z. So each letter of the key can be one of 26 values. So what we get is 26. So how many possible keys? 26 times 26 times 26 21 times. So, 26 to the power of 21 in that case. So, 
So it depends upon the length of the plain text. So how many keys is that? 26 to the power of 21. Uh, calculator time. That many keys. Okay. Well, what's that? Can we make it into something? Can I guess? Uh, I'll see. It's about 5 by 10 to the power of 29. Okay, that is, this number is 26 to the power of 21. 26 to the power of 21 divided by 10 to the power of 29 is 5. So the answer, this number, is about 29 digits there, 30 digits. So that's the, the number of keys if my plain text is 21 characters. What if I have a longer plain text? Maybe, I don't know, and I've, in one of the handouts I did an example with 370 characters for some reason, I think. Just a, a long uh, sequence. Well, the more characters, the no more possible keys. I think it was 370 something. Uh, okay. You count the, zero, the number of digits there, 10 to the power of whatever, 200 or, or, or 300, I, I don't know. How many is that? Uh, if I could do decryption at a rate of 10 to the power of 20 decryptions per second, Okay, so how many seconds would it take to do a brute force attack? Well, if this is the number of keys and I could decrypt at 10 to the power of 20 per second, then the answer of this would be the number of seconds. Okay. All right, divide by 60, the number of minutes. To convert minutes to hours, divided by another 60, to convert hours to days divided by 24, days to years, and what's bigger than years? Years to centuries divided by 100. Well, that, so here's the number here. This many centuries to do a brute force attack. Big number, okay? So brute force against this simple uh, 370 character plain text, a short plain text in this case, is impossible. It's not possible for a one time pad. So, a one time pad uh, is not possible in practice. It turns out it's not possible in theory either. Even if we had the f computer with infinite power. It turns out if we could calculate at this speed and get an answer, the result would have many plain text values. Okay. Many of those plain text values that would make sense, that would be English phrases and sentences. With our brute force on the Caesar cipher, remember we had 26 plain text values. Only one of them made sense. But if you did a brute force attack on a one time pad, you'd have many possible plain text values that make sense. Only one of them is the real one. So as an attacker, there's no way to know of those many possible plain text values which one may, is the real one. You just have to guess. And of course, that's, uh, it turns out, almost impossible to guess, especially when you have billions and billions of possible plain text that make sense. So it turns out the one-time pad you cannot do cryptanalysis against. And you cannot, even with an infinite power computer, do a brute force attack against. And of course, we don't have an infinite power computer. So we should stop our course. Because we have a cipher that's relatively easy to implement. We have a cipher that's perfect in terms of secrecy. What's the problem? Why do we keep going? Well. It relies on having a key which is as long as the plain text. 
So if I want to encrypt a DVD, okay, DVD, what, about 5 gigabytes? I want to encrypt a DVD file and then I want to make that available to someone so I choose a key which must be also 5 gigabytes so I have to have a, the DVD and a key both 5 gigabytes so I must somehow distribute that 5 gigabyte key to the next person so they can decrypt very inconvenient and very wasteful of resources because we doubled uh, the amount of storage or, or transmission bandwidth it's very hard to deal with such long keys. And the keys must be random. And it turns out to be secure, we must, every time we encrypt something, we must use a different random key. So we must be able to generate random numbers which don't repeat. Because if they repeat, it's no longer random. We've got a topic on random numbers later. It turns out that generating long random numbers is not very easy, quite impractical to generate random numbers with a computer. So one time pad we say is provides perfect security. It is unbreakable in terms of brute force attack or cryptanalysis, but it's very impractical. Dealing with long keys is not convenient. Generating long random keys is very difficult. So in fact, it has very limited practical use, despite its security. Here's an example taken from the textbook. Uh, it's the case where the attacker knew this ciphertext. Okay, so they, they had the ciphertext. And let's say the attacker did a, tried a brute force attack. Not possible, but let's say they could do a brute force attack. So they try all the keys. It turns out that there are two keys, these two that I've selected. Of all the possible keys, I've just cho chosen two keys. This key that they tried produced this plain text. And this second key produced this plain text. Now, as the attacker, with a brute force attack, you take the ciphertext, try all keys, and then you must recognize which potential plaintext is the correct one. Which of these two is the correct one? Does anyone know? You, you cannot know. You cannot know for sure. Okay? Because they both make sense. And in fact, if you tried all the keys in the case, you'd get many, many more plain text that makes sense. So the attacker, even if they do a brute force, they'll get many potential plain text that make sense, and therefore they will not be able to determine which one's the real plain text. And that's why we say that the one-time pad is unbreakable in terms of the brute force attack. There was a mistake in this, just as an aside. There was a mistake. Did I fix it? Anyone see the mistake? Remember, this is the one-time pad just using the Caesar cipher. Uh, did I fix it or not? Let me check your lecture notes. Is it the same? Ah, okay, I fixed mine. Yours is different. What's the mistake in your lecture notes, the printed ones? The first three letters of key two are wrong in your lecture notes. I've fixed it on here. So I think you have M something, uh, MF something, correct? It should be PFT. So in key two, the first three letters two of them are wrong in your lecture notes. And I've corrected them here. If you look in the textbook, I copied from the textbook. The textbook was wrong. I'm not blaming the textbook, but the textbook has what you see on yours. And it was maybe not last year, the year before in this class, one of the students pointed out there's a mistake there. 
and in fact confirmed it was and uh, we, we told the textbook author and now he's fixing the textbook based upon some of your senior students' feedback during the lecture. Okay, so you can pick up some errors and, and influence the textbook and other sources. So fix PFT is key two, the correct start of key two. How, do you, how, do you de how did I detect that, or how did the student detect that? It wasn't me. What we do is take the plain text, encrypt with P using a Caesar cipher, we get the letter A. Take the plain text here, encrypt with P, M with P, we must get the same letter A. Whereas in your lecture notes, I think you had here M, encrypted with M, cannot get the letter A if M encrypted with P gives the letter A. So in fact, uh, it's quite easy to detect that mistake. Okay, we've gone through a number of classical ciphers going from a very simple Caesar cipher from 2,000 years ago moved to monoalphabetic and then we looked at Playfair where we operate on two characters at a time as a way to distribute the, the statistics of the ciphertext. Uh, then we looked at Visionaire which just extends upon the Caesar cipher. And a modification of Visionaire is instead of using a fixed length keyword, use a random keyword which is as long as the plain text and we get the one-time pad. And the one-time pad is perfect in terms of security, but impractical in terms of performance and convenience. These were all substitution ciphers. In the last 10 minutes, let's look at, at just two transposition ciphers. Substitution, we took one letter from the character set and replaced it with some other letter from the character set. So, in hello, H-E-L-L-O with a Caesar cipher, we replaced H with some other letter from the alphabet of A through to Z. Transposition just rearranges the letters in the plain text. It doesn't replace. First one, rail fence transposition. Take the plain text, and write it row by row. So in the example, we say the number of rows, the depth, is 3. So what we do is we take the plain text and write I on the first row, N on the second row, T on the third row, and then E back to the first row. Let's try We have internet technologies and applications. You'll do that. Uh, let's try a shorter example. Got one. Not much shorter, but a little bit. We have our plain text. I've just chosen some words to make it long enough. And we choose a key. The key for the rail fence is the depth or the number of rows. Let's choose a key of three. Which means we write this plain text in three rows. And you'll see what that means here. H, E, L, L, O. And keep going. So just write the plain text in three rows and read row by row to get the ciphertext. The first row, H, L, T, E, C, I, and then the second row, E, O, E, 
S U T, and then the third row. We've just rearranged according to this algorithm of the rail fence cipher. No substitutions. The set of letters in the plain text are the same as the set of letters in the cipher text. Let's try the next one uh, and then we'll do a little bit of analysis. Another one, just another rearrangement, the rows column. We choose instead of a depth, a single value for the number of rows, we choose a, a key as a set of uh, integers which will determine some way that we rearrange the columns. We'll do that one. Security and cryptography 315624. So the plain text crypto cryptography or was it three one five six two four? What we do is we write the plain text in rows and columns. So write the first row, the second row, and then the third row, and the number of columns is determined by the key. In this case we have six integers in the key, so we'll have six columns. and move on to the next row. That's a Y. And because we need to fill out the rows, let's add some padding and let's just add some special character. I'll choose X. And now, how do we get the cipher text? We use the key, and the key tells us which columns to read first. So we have a key of 315624. I'll write it again. 3156 to four, we read column by column, column one first, column two, column three. So our cipher text, column one, according to our key, is E Y Y A. Column two, R D O Y. Column three, four, five is C A P P, and the last column is U N T H. So again, it's just a different way to rearrange our plain text. Same set of characters in the ciphertext as there are in the plaintext. There's no substitution, just rearrangement or called transposition or sometimes called permutation, a permutation of our plaintext. Make sure you know how to encrypt and decrypt these two. Encrypt is quite simple. This one you need a little bit of thought to decrypt. 
make sure you can remember how to decrypt. Just think how to do it such that you get the original plain text back. You always see in an exam, here's some ciphertext, decrypt using rows and columns for a particular key. Or even one year I asked, here's the ciphertext, no key, find the plain text. So with some intelligence you can start to guess words, guess the arrangement of columns, and see some patterns and work out what the key is and then what the plain text is. How to decrypt? That's a good question. You'll work it out. You decrypt, think about going backwards. Okay. Start with this. You have a key. You need to get the plain text. The key tells you there are six columns. Therefore, how many characters here? 24 characters, six columns. So you're going to write, break it into chunks of four. So this would be a column, these four are column, STRR is a column. So you can write them in the columns, but the arrangement of the columns must be based upon the key. So this will be a column, EYYA, RDOY will be another column, and then use, use the key to work out what the arrangement of those columns are. Try, try that. If you can decrypt these two and encrypt all the classical ones we've covered and decrypt the classical ones we've covered so far, then you understand the basics. Let's stop there. We'll talk about the, the advantages and disadvantages and how these can help in real ciphers, how these concepts can help in real ciphers uh, on the Thursday. You have an online quiz to do, and it's open now, and it closes at, I think, 1 p.m. next Tuesday. So you have about a week to do it. It closes before the first lecture next week. Next week. Do the online quiz, which has some cipher questions and some concepts from what we've covered so far.